today. Um, today I'm going to be talking about how suppress suppressing stemness can combat uh, aggressive breast cancers. All right, so I put this slide in just for context. Uh, we've heard a lot of other speakers this morning talk about a lot of other subjects. So uh, today I'm gonna be uh, talking about cancer. Um, so cancer is just an uncontrolled growth of your own cells. Uh, they form a mass uh, called a tumor. So here's an example of a tumor. This one's actually grown on a uh, chicken embryo so we can see it more readily. Uh, all of the red color you see here is blood. So blood can help the tumor to grow. Uh, these red squiggly lines are actually uh, blood vessels that are supplying oxygen and nutrients to this tumor. So solid tumors represent most of the new uh, cancer cases. Uh, so, in, so I've highlighted in red here, uh, some of the most common solid tumors in both men and women. Uh, in men, it is led by prostate cancer, in women by breast cancer, uh, followed closely by lung and colon cancer in both sexes, among others. And most of these same solid tumors are responsible for most of the cancer deaths. Uh, there's one notable change here. Uh, whereas lung cancer was only responsible for about 13% of the can new cancer cases, uh, it is now responsible for about a quarter of all cancer deaths in both sexes. So most of these are actually due to smoking. And if we stop smoking, uh, about a quarter of all cancer deaths just magically go away. So it's just something to consider. Uh, so behind lung cancer in men is prostate cancer and in women is breast cancer. And this will be the focus of my talk today. But in all solid tumors, there's a desperate need for new therapies. All right, so what makes breast cancer so deadly? So here's my little schematic of a primary breast cancer. Uh, the blue blobs here are the tumor cells and in these uh, pale ovals inside are supposed to represent the nuclei. So if a tumor just stays put, it's basically harmless. Uh, it can be removed by surgery and the patient's gonna be just fine. The problem arises when some of these tumor cells travel to distant sites, uh, such as the lung, uh, bone marrow, or even the brain. And this process is called metastasis. Now, some of these cells may then grow a secondary tumor at these sites. Uh, this can cause organ dysfunction, and this is ultimately what proves to be fatal. And so this is arguably the most important problem in breast cancer research. And metastasis is thought to be responsible for about 40,000 deaths uh, each year in the U.S. alone. So metastasis occurs in discrete steps known as the metastatic cascade. So most solid tumors arise from a sheet of cells called an epithelium. Uh, in response to a transforming event, they then uh, grow a benign or pre-malignant mass. However, it's not invasive cancer until it uh, migrates through this basement membrane shown here by this yellow line. So once this happens, the tumor cells gain access to the surrounding tissue and they can invade into blood vessels, which transport them to distant sites, uh, such as the liver, the lung, bone, barrel, uh, bone marrow, uh, brain, among others. Uh, once there, some of these cells can arrest within the blood vessel, whereas others can exit the blood vessel in a process known as extravasation. Then some of these cells may divide a couple of times and then stop growing or become dormant. And these are known as micrometastases. And these are basically harmless. Uh, many cancer patients have lots of these micrometastases, but they don't cause any problems. The real problem arises when some of these cells, for unknown reasons, undergoes colonization and forms a secondary tumor. Uh, this is fairly rare, occurring in less than one in a thousand cells, it's believed, and therefore this colonization step is believed to be a rate limiting in the metastatic cascade. And just to drive home this point about how bad metastasis can be, Here's a, a PET image of a medulloblastoma patient. 
Uh, all of these black dots that you see are metastases. And if we overlie this image uh, onto the soft tissue, so some of the organs and tissues supply some background, but we can still see that this uh, patient has metastases all over their body. Uh, in the lymph nodes and the underarm, uh, these are the uh, uh, skeletal metastases in the rib cage and in the pelvic bone as well. So it can really be a devastating disease. So not to be all doom and gloom, uh, we have come a long way in breast cancer research. Uh, in, in the past, uh, any woman with a lump in her breast underwent this procedure called a radical bilateral mastectomy. Uh, this involves removal of both breasts and the underlying pectoral muscles. Uh, it was horribly disfiguring and ultimately proven to be unnecessary. So fortunately today, this is very rare. And we have great targeted therapies for some types of breast cancer. If your cancer has something called the estrogen receptor, then anti-estrogen therapy will be highly effective. Similarly, if your cancer has a receptor called HER2, uh, then we will use this drug called Herceptin, which will uh, work quite well to keep that tumor in check. And we live in the age of advanced genomics. It's now very commonplace to sequence uh, a given patient's tumor for particular mutations. And then based on the mutations present in that tumor, uh, devise a personalized therapy that can help those patients live longer. And finally, surgeons have become quite good at removing breast cancers. This is done routinely um, and with great success. And so there's been a lot of progress made in the fight against breast cancer, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So I just mentioned that most deaths from breast cancer are occurring because of metastatic disease. So how do we go about treating this? Well, to tackle this problem, my lab has chosen to examine stem cells. Now, these are not the stem cells you may have heard about from the embryo. These stem cells only exist in the mammary glands of adult women. Uh, now, similar cells do exist in the glands from uh, mice as well. And this provides us with a nice uh, model system um, for the study of these cells. All right, so what exactly is a stem cell? How do we define them? Well, the best, data, best way to answer this question, I think, is to show you an experiment. So if we take a very young mouse, about three weeks old, so it's prepubescent, we can actually surgically remove the little piece of glandular tissue that's present. So it's important to let you know at this stage that Mouse mammary glands look a little different than people. Uh, they're oval and they're very flat. And so this white space here is supposed to represent the, the fat pad, the fat tissue. And this blue represents a lymph node within the gland. And so this line right here is showing you the little piece of tissue that we've cut away. And so all that's left behind is what we call a cleared fat pad. So there's no glandular tissue present. Now, if we take an adult uh, mouse and we harvest the stem cells, we can inject them into this cleared fat pad. And if stem cells are present, then they will regrow a mammary gland. That's what the stem cells do. And we call this an outgrowth. And these outgrowths consist of uh, ducts, which are represented here by these little blue squiggly lines. This takes about 10 weeks to happen, so it takes a little while. And this is what it looks like in real life. So if no stem cells are present, then you basically have an empty fat pad. Uh, this is a lymph node, and this is a blood vessel running through it. But if there are stem cells present, then they will form an outgrowth like the one you see here. So we've stained this in red, so it's much easier to see. Uh, here's that same lymph node. Uh, and we can further breed these mice and show that these outgrowths can uh, indeed produce milk. So they are functional. So we think this ability of stem cells to form outgrowths like this uh, might be similar to this metastatic colonization process that I mentioned to you earlier. All right, so why have stem cells at all? What, 
they were clearly not there just to form outgrowths in our little experiment, right? Elegant though it may be. So why do we have stem cells? So let's go back to our uh, mouse mammary gland schematic here. So this is the non-pregnant uh, situation. So the oval represents the fat pad. Uh, this central blue dot is the lymph node, and right here we have the nipple with the uh, ductal network emanating from it and filling the fat pad. So the mammary gland is uh, actually one of the most highly dynamic organs in adult women. So in response to hormones during the menstrual cycle or pregnancy, the gland will proliferate. It, there'll be lots of branches that will form. Numerous little structures called alveoli will form, and these are the structures that will secrete milk. And so it's a very complex and coordinated process. And actually, once this happens, once the hormones go away, the whole gland will then involute back to um, the kind of pre-hormone state. And so this is the reason stem cells exist. They are there for this re remodeling process. They initiate remodeling in response to hormones. So we wondered whether these stem cells might also be important for metastasis. So in order to answer this question, we needed a stem cell marker so we could actually look for it in uh, cancers. So long story short, we discovered this cell surface receptor called the integrin alpha V beta three and showed that cells expressing this marker were indeed stem cells and were important for uh, formation of the mouse mammary gland. So if we look at one of these uh, ducts a little closer in cross section, they're actually composed of two different cell layers. So this inner cell layer lining the lumen are the aptly named luminal cells. And this outer cell layer in contact with the basement membrane are the basal cells. And so we asked where these alpha V beta three positive stem cells reside. And the answer is they're found within this outer cell layer. So the basal cell layer is where you find the stem cells. So next we asked if this alpha V beta three might be required for stem cell behavior. So we performed this elegant little experiment where we took mice in which the beta-3 gene had been deleted. So these are beta-3 knockout mice, and we compared them against uh, wild-type mice that have the beta-3 gene. So normally during pregnancy, these wild-type mice uh, will undergo extensive remodeling in the mammary gland. You'll have all that proliferation and branching and all these uh, little circular structures um, called alveoli will form. But in the beta-3 knockout animals, this was not the case. There was a defect. We saw fewer branches and fewer alveoli forming. And this was in contrast to the virgin adult mammary glands where there was basically no effect of deleting beta-3. It was very similar to the wild type. And so this suggested to us that alpha V beta-3 may not only be a marker of stem cells, but of activated stem cells, stem cells that were involved in this remodeling process. So we wondered whether similar cells may also exist in people. So in collaboration with Dr. Pepper Shadeen at Oregon Health and Science University, we obtained sections uh, from the mammary glands of pregnant women and compared them against age-matched women who've never been pregnant. So we stained for uh, an antibody against the uh, beta-3, and this staining uh, is shown here in brown. And indeed, we found that beta-3 is expressed predominantly within this outer basal cell layer within these alveoli with very few of these inner luminal cells actually expressing beta-3. Whereas in the never pregnant glands, there was essentially no beta-3 expression. So this was very similar to our data from the mouse where the beta-3 was turned on during pregnancy predominantly within that basal cell layer. So now we wanted to know if these stem cells might play a role in metastasis. So for these studies, uh, we obtained uh, patient breast cancer uh, tumor sections. So these are from actual breast cancer patients. Uh, and we stained for beta-3, which this time is shown here by, in, by blue. And so this is an example of one of these cells. Here is a stem-like tumor cell within an actual patient's cancer. Um, so the blue is showing the beta-3, and this brown here is the nucleus. 
Now you'll notice that the neighboring cells do not have the beta-3, right? So our stem-like cells are only a small subset of the overall tumor cell population. So this is an example of tumor heterogeneity, where we now know that a single patient's tumor can actually have many different types of cells within it. So next we asked if these stem-like cells might predict metastasis. So if, if we took patient tumor that had these cells, would that patient go on to form metastases? And indeed, we found that 84% of those patients ended up developing metastasis. So this was quite good at predicting metastasis. And so currently we're studying a more direct role for these cells in uh, metastasis. This is really a quite a uh, complex uh, series of experiments. And so I'll um, be happy to answer questions about this later if you're curious about how we're tackling this problem. But for now, I'll just leave you with our model. Uh, so we think that if you have one of these stem-like tumor cells, that if it travels to a place such as the lungs, that these cells would be more likely to grow a metastasis, to undergo this colonization I talked about before. But not only that, we think these cells may also be more resistant against standard chemotherapies, allowing them to survive post-therapy and regrow a tumor, which is called a recurrence. So we think these are very aggressive tumor cells. All right, so what's in store for the future? Well, I imagine personalized therapies based on the cellular composition or makeup of a tumor, much like we already have for genetic mutations. Uh, my lab has already identified several different targeted therapies that can kill these stem-like tumor cells. And now we're investigating how they, these might be more, the most effective. So we think that these stem-like tumor cell therapies might um, be most effective when given along with chemotherapy. This would prevent them from surviving post-therapy and hopefully prevent metastasis and recurrence from happening. 